So hello and welcome to week one of the history of video games. My name is Parker and uh, if you couldn't tell for the fact that I'm doing this, I like video games a lot and I hope by the end of this you all will too. So I've always wanted to do something like this and I always told myself one day I was going to give a talk or I was going to, I don't know, try to get an accredited class. Who knew if that would ever happen? Um, but then, you know, through the power of the internet, I just realized I can just do this. Uh, so we will. We absolutely will. Um, now, remember, your parents paid really good money to have you in this class. So, you know, you will get out what you put in. Uh, there's no books or no homework, though. So you got that going for you. But without further ado, let us begin here. So... First off, I want to go discuss what you will take away from this class, or what I hope you take away from this class. First off, I really hope that you take away this appreciation for a really underappreciated topic. I'm going to drop this music here real fast. Hope that still sounds good to everybody. But yes, you'll be taking away appreciation for a really underappreciated topic. Video games, unfortunately, are something that really hasn't been preserved that well, especially if you look at other forms of media, uh, such as film and literature. Video games have a tough time, um, especially the history of them. And let me tell you, it's a fascinating and wild history. Um, you, you know, this is actually relevant. You might have seen a recent advertisement for an Apple TV show based on the story of Tetris. And if you've seen it, you know that that's a wild ride. That is one of thousands of stories just like that throughout this industry. And I hope to shed light and discuss them with you guys. So, alongside that appreciation, I really hope that you can also get some really interesting insights on team leadership and product development. Video games are a business, uh, first and foremost. That's truly what they are. And because of that, it doesn't really matter what you're doing in your life right now. You could be climbing the corporate ladder. You could be working on a small team on a project to make your product, you know, viable. You can be an artist, a musician, a programmer, maybe even, you know, in game development yourself. These are important takeaways that you can get from these stories and these experiences of others that you can really use. Uh, next up, uh, definitely a knowledge of the industry, both past and present. Kind of obvious that you're going to learn something, right? But honestly, it's, it's as I said before, the entire history of video games is something that's really underlooked and underutilized. So being able to kind of take an examination of that, I feel is very important. And finally, uh, you will have the ability to out-nerd all of your friends. Um, I'm going to put that with the caveat that uh, if I am your friend, I'm sorry, I'm the professor, you can't beat me. It just won't happen. <laughs> so. But Jesus Christ, I hate, I hate slides sometimes. There we go. We're fine. We're good. But first off, we need to ask yourself here. Why should I care? Why should I care about the history of video games? What does it matter when I'm going to the store and I'm buying FIFA or Call of Duty or Mario Kart? Why should I give a darn about video games, especially the history of them? Why does that matter? Well, like every good presentation, I'm going to give you a number. $56 billion. That is how much the video game industry made last year alone. To give you an idea, compared to the film industry in 2022, that is over double the amount of money that they that they raked in. And video games, you have to remember, if you look at the start of the film industry and the start of the video game industry, the game industry has only been around for less than half the time of film. And they're already and they're right now making it double the income. So even if you really don't care about video games, maybe you're interested in the stock market. Maybe you're interested in business analytics. It's something to pay attention to. Second of all, limitations bring innovations. And I'm going to 
scoot myself down there because I made myself way too big. That's, a, that's my bad. See, that's what I'm saying. A limitation of this layout. I had to shrink myself down. But no, limitations bring innovations. At the end of the day, the video game industry is about making compromises. Because at the end of the day, you can't make the best video game console or the biggest video game possible. You can. Technically, you could. But if you made a video game console that could display Pixar-like graphics, nobody could afford to buy it. If you made a game that literally included the entire world, nobody would fund you. So you gotta really take that into consideration that with limitations of size and scope and budget, you can flourish. You've probably heard, you know, the whole thing of restrictions breed creativity. And the same is true when you're designing a product. Is that if you are being, you know, pushed into a corner because you're only having to develop for something three, four, five years older than what maybe you intended, that's honestly going to help make some really cool ideas come to the surface. Next up, mistakes make us stronger. The video game industry has been around for about 50 years. And uh, let's just say mistakes have happened. Um, if you know anything about video games, you know exactly what is on screen right now. And we'll get to that in due time. It's actually one of my favorite weird systems. So we'll, we'll get to talk about that. But yeah, we can learn from the past. I mean, which sounds very obvious, you know, in retrospect, but it's true. We can learn from the past. And that helps us kind of go to the future and say, well, you know, I remember 20 years ago, somebody tried doing this and it didn't work out, but maybe we could adapt that or with the technology, we can do this now. I'm not even talking about you going to the game industry. I'm saying if you're about to pitch an idea or if you're about to start a service or do anything like that, you know, that's absolutely something that really brings a lot of potential. So we're going to be seeing a lot of mistakes in the game industry. Trust me, it is not smooth sailing at all. But just remember that mistakes are what make things better. Except for the companies that went under, but we'll, we'll get into that. We'll get into that. So let's do a little bit of a, a homework. Sorry, I know I promised no homework. This is just quick. I guess this is more an in-clash discussion. So to everybody watching here, I want you to think of what was the first video game you ever played? Even if you say you don't play video games, I guarantee you, you've at least probably tried one. Even just a passing moment. Remember what it made you feel, the experience, because the first time you play a game, it's something very special. So keep that into your mind. Also, incidentally, this is a great icebreaker to icebreaker to kind of get the age range of everybody um because i can look at your first game and just be like oh yeah you're you're around from that era see i've gotten to the point where uh i can judge your age by what game system was out when you were a kid it's very nerdy i know trust me i'm it's the best way to best way to pick people up at a bar i guarantee you so next up Let's get into a little bit of a talk. What is a video game? I know this seems like a really simple question, but it's very important for laying out the groundwork because uh, if week one here, we're gonna be talking about the early history of the video game. It determine what a video game is, we kind of have to determine a definition for what is a video game. So, a video game, and I enjoy my face got very red when I just pulled up this next slide. I need to get better lighting for this. And you can help with better lighting if you hit that subscribe button and drop a follow. Thank you. Sorry. Listen, even when I'm trying to be professional, I have to plug myself. It's, it's just what happens. But a video game is a device or program in which the user interacts with objects in real time on a video display usually with an objective or end goal. This definition makes sense, and it's also worded in a way that can help kind of eliminate some early possible video games that really aren't. 
Uh, for example, in 1950, a computer program called Birdie the Brain was displayed in Canada. Uh, it allowed you to play tic-tac-toe against the computer. However, it didn't display its images on a video screen. Instead, it would just display them on a bunch of lights. This ruins our definition here, but it also helps us go into a more clear definition. Because if we took the definition where Birdie the Brain was allowed to be considered the first video game, then by context, if you just had a bank of light switches you could flip on and flip off, and if you made a game around that, that would technically count. So with this kind of groundwork, let's talk about the first video game. So, the year is 1951, and Christopher Strachey is working at a computer lab in London, where he kind of reads some papers worked on by someone you may have heard of called Alan Turing. Now, Alan Turing has been working for a while on basically this theoretical program for a computer. Remember, computers at this time were extremely, extremely early, so a lot of times they couldn't really do things to really work uh, the way they wanted to. So Alan Turing had wrote this paper for making a game of chess, um, and he had basically laid out all this hypothetical code that could be fed into a computer, and it would play chess. Now Christopher Strachey found this uh, article, found it extremely interesting, but realized that at the time, no computer would be able to create the game of chess. However, the Ferenta, for, sorry, the Ferranti MK1 computer, which had just come out two years ago, looked like it had some power. And Christopher decided that he would try to make the game Droughts, uh, better known as Checkers, um, here in the US. So he wrote to Turing, told him about his intentions, and Turing, who was actually kind of heading up the lab that made the computer, basically sent him a very loose, very, very confusing programmer's handbook, basically. So, uh, he worked on droughts, and there's kind of a weird mix-up here. So, technically speaking, he first tried his game in 1951, but the game failed to run. Now, between 51 and 52, he might have had it working earlier, we don't know. However, we have photographic proof, which is actually what you're seeing here, of the game working in the summer of 1952, I believe it was July, which would make this the first video game. Checkers against the computer. Simple, but the concept is proven. Now let's move to 1952. Now the reason I want to talk about this is I think it's very important, and also because a lot of people don't know about Christopher's story, so a lot of people kind of go to this man here. This is Alexander Douglas down there in the bottom right. Uh, he, like Christopher, also was in the computer programming kind of field in the 50s in, in the UK. And he kind of had the same idea that Christopher had, although definitely a little bit less ambitious. Uh, he decided to make a game of tic-tac-toe. Uh, Knots and Crosses um, in the UK. The game was uh, programmed on an EDSAC computer. This computer was basically used for weather analysis, mathematical computations, um, and stuff like that. But it had a display that would be able to display kind of this dot grid. And it, how this display actually worked, and it was the same with uh, Droughts actually, is that the what happened is these are vector-based displays. So what happens is that a beam of light is directed at the screen. Now most times these um, images were just used to show things like wave lines, patterns, but there was one screen that had a bunch of dots that was literally a diagnostic screen. The dots you kind of see there are memory. So a bright one would go brighter if there was an error. So by taking advantage of this, he was able to program this game. and. Interestingly, uh, the way that you could play this game uh, was with a rotary phone. Uh, so basically, you have spots 1 through 9, that's your grid. So, you know, if top left is 1, next over is 2, then 3, etc. You would literally have to dial in which position you like to go to. Um, also, 
here's the fun thing too because tic-tac-toe is a mathematically solved game the robot was ruthless basically you could not win this game unless you started first so that was and so that was oxo um and it technically was actually called oxo um he just called it knots and crosses however um to kind of in later on when people were working on trying to restore and preserve the edsac computers the name was kind of changed to oxo to kind of sound more like a game because this was one of the big achievements of oxo outside of all the work it did in the science of weather computations and everything was it you know somebody put a game on there now we're going to move in time forward in time a little bit to 1958 now 1958 we need to go to a laboratory sandbrook laboratory in new york and talk about a man named william higginbotham william higginbotham was employed at sandbrook laboratory which was this government laboratory at the time working in nuclear research uh in particular he was using an oscilloscope and a computer that was made to calculate the trajectory of ballistic missiles on top of this the laboratory was also you know doing a lot of work with chemicals things like that and uh let's just say people were kind of a little bit suspicious of this laboratory you gotta remember you know the cold war was very much in the works people were kind of iffy on a uh, the whole, the whole thing of, of nuclear weapons, things like that. So they didn't really like this laboratory. So basically to kind of help ease the public, uh, the Sandbrook Laboratory would have visitor days, basically. And all the different departments, the so, you know, your chemical department, your aeronautics department, and your atomics department, which was um, Higginbotham's field, would basically have these display booths. And you would go in and you would be you know, seeing some work on a new chemical formula or supersonic flight, stuff like that. But as you would guess from a laboratory, these people were very nerdy and weren't the best at trying to interact with the public. So Higginbotham basically decided he wanted to have some way, basically to one-up everybody. There was kind of this inside competition between all the departments to have the best display during these, these public events. So Higginbotham developed Tennis for Two. This is technically the first sports game. It was the first game available to the public because people were actually got to go in and play it. And it was the first game made for two players. Now, the stories that we have, and again, we don't have any full evidence, but a lot of people have kind of agreed that this is what happened, is this booth for Tennis for Two was so popular the line went out the door and wrapped around the entire laboratory complex for people to play this for 30 seconds. Uh, the game was only there for two years, 1958 for 1959. After that, Higginbotham decided his work was done, he showed what he wanted to show, and he disassembled it. However, luckily in 1997, as kind of this Sandbrook anniversary happened, they decided to recreate Tennis for Two, and I'm going to drop the, the, the background music we have here for a second because I, I get to show you guys. This is footage, the oldest footage we have of the oldest video game. So you can see here the aim of the game is hitting just a ball back and forth together on this oscilloscope. There is the interaction button. You have a dial to move your paddle up and down and then a button to hit the ball. And that's really all there is to it. But again, this is a simple game made on from technology from 1958. We had not even gone to the moon yet at this point. Going to the moon was near like nearly 10 years away. And yet, in a laboratory, so that people would think that work on nuclear physics research was cool... Higginbotham made this. I really wish I could get, get all that stuff away. YouTube is a finicky beast at times. So. Tennis for Two happened, but the Sandbrook Laboratory was not the only kind of research institute working on the idea of video games. For that, we need to go to MIT. 
MIT in 1961 saw something kind of amazing. A programming student by the name of Steve Russell was interested in the new PDP computer, uh, the PDP-1, that MIT had just gotten. The PDP-1 was used for calculations, uh, trajectories, things like that, but it had a considerable amount of power uh, compared to a lot of other, th other things out there. So they decided to try to use this power and make a game. And what they came up with was Space War. Space War was pretty simple. Uh, it was basically two spaceships flying around in space trying to shoot each other down. But it has some little fun things about it. First off, it was the first publicly distributed game. Because technically, you can go and buy a PDP-1 uh, back in the day. And if you knew somebody who had access to the code, you could program Space War on your PDP-1. And on top of that, this might be the first eSport ever? Uh, so, the stories on this are a bit flaky. But according to legend, um, when this got to MIT, they had a basically um, students that were doing broadcast TV. And they decided that they were going to point a camera at the screen and have it be projected to some televisions, kind of in a, in a auditorium, where people would watch them play on a larger screen. And you know, I mean, this is MIT, this is a college town. Who's to say there maybe wasn't some prize money going on, maybe some betting on the side, which, technically, if the story is true, Space War is your first eSport. Forget about Fortnite, forget about Smash Brothers. Let's bring back competitive Space War, shall we? So, the things about everything that we've seen before is they've all been created in scientific institutes. There's never really been an idea of, let's sell this game. The closest that came was kind of Space War, but the PDP-1 was like $120,000 back in the day, which is like a million dollars now. So it really would not be feasible to make this a commercial product. But that changed with Ralph Baer. Now, Ralph Baer uh, is a very interesting man. Uh, grew up in Germany, uh, defected to escape the Nazis during World War II, found his way to America with his family, and there he worked for a company called Sanders & Associates. Now, Sanders & Associates was basically a television products company. So Ralph Baer had a really good idea of kind of the television market, and he kind of had this theory, because he has been working on different devices, and he thought, well, what if I made a device that would allow us to manipulate the TV signal? Because Ralph's logic is that at the time, there's about 40 million TVs in America. So even if 1%, just 1% likes his idea, that's 400,000 units sold right there. So over the years, from about 1966 to 1968, he works on something that is affectionately be called the Brown Box. The Brown Box is basically the prototype for what would become the video game console. Um, basically how it worked is you had two controllers, as you can see up there. Um, this image actually here, I believe, is the one grabbed from the, from the National Video Game Museum. Um, the original actual one, the original prototype, uh, it's in the depths of the Smithsonian right now. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. So, the way that you would pick games for this system was those switches that you see, and I can move my head so you can get a better look here. And the switches that you see over there on the top of the box. By different switch combinations, you could get the objects to interact in different ways. Now, Sanders thought this was a pretty good idea, uh, Sanders Associates. So, in 1968, they filed for and received a patent, basically for anything that manipulated the signal on the TV. Keep that in your mind, because next week we'll be talking about that. In 1971, Sanders decided to sell the rights to the company Magnavox and create this. This is the Magnavox Odyssey. This is, this is special. So this is the first ever video game console. Uh, it released for a retail price of about $100. Um, today, that's roughly about $700. So definitely wasn't cheap. It was also only sold in Magnavox stores, so if you wanted one of these, you had to go to a brick-and-mortar Magnavox store, or 
have the Magnavox salesman come to you. Because of this, it's only about 350,000 units were ever produced, producing about 28 games, and it had some limited graphics. Now, the Magnavox Audi CV is very special. There, we fixed it. All right. I, I don't know why there was no audio. Thank you. So this is why I wanted to stream it. So that way, if there was no audio, we'd get it anyway. So whether it's through um, a bad decision on my part um, or just pure luck, here's a Magnavox Odyssey. Now, the Magnavox Odyssey, as you can probably tell from the fact that uh, this is my head, it's a big boy. It is a very large boy. On the back here, we have two independent switches, uh, or dials, sorry. Uh, one is for the speed of the ball, and one is for the horizontal hold. Or one is for the um, center, actually. So you can center the line. This game basically played ping pong. So if you think ping pong, this played ping pong and a lot of other stuff, too. Uh, it had two controller ports here and here. And also a port for an optional gun accessory. Um, I did not grab one of the controllers for up here to show you. The cords are massive and bulky. Now, the games for the Magnavox Odyssey were technically not games, actually. This is one of the games, Game 4. Uh, I believe this one was for um, hockey as well as a couple others. But these are not games. There's no data stored on these. Instead, when you insert a game... I'll see if I can't do this in a way you can all see it. When you insert a game into the Odyssey, this is extremely difficult to do by not looking at it. There we go. The system actually powers itself on. Now, not right now. I don't have any batteries in it, but it would. And the games, as I said, don't have any data on them. Instead, they would reconfigure the circuits. Basically, they would jump certain circuits that would allow the, the programs to interact differently. And the graphics on this weren't very good. If you can kind of see... Well, we'll get back to it. Um, sorry, I, I realize I can't go back to my picture, but it's good. I can just go this. So, the game really couldn't do graphics on the Odyssey. So, you had these. These are the overlays for the Magnavox Odyssey. And if you got to think about it, um, if you might remember a TV of the day, a CRT TV has all that static. If you ever put your hand on a CRT, remember that static electricity. So, these, literally, you just stick it on, and the static would cling to it. And that's how you'd have your graphics, because without using the overlay, the Odyssey basically only produces a couple of uh, white lines, basically. And I'm sure the sound of this piece of plastic sounds lovely. It's away now. You're safe. <laughs> The interesting thing about the Odyssey 2 is kind of the way it was marketed. Basically, the, the word video game didn't really exist yet. So it was advertised as the electronic game of the future. And it was kind of less a video game system and more of a board game system. If you ever have the chance, you can look up the manual for the Magnavox Odyssey. It's preserved online. It's beautifully 70s cheesy space age sci-fi it's beautiful to take a look at but you can kind of see a lot of the gameplay was more the accessories that came with it whether it was cards or dice that was kind of it but now it's time to kind of talk about something that you guys have probably heard about so 1972 Particularly, this is November. The Odyssey, by the way, came out in May of 72. So the Odyssey to beat it. We need to talk about a couple of people. We need to talk about Nolan Bushnell. Now, Nolan Bushnell, you might have heard that name before. He had created a company called Scissorgy in 1971. And he had tried to release a home computer game. Or, or a home arc, or a arcade computer game called Space War. It was... Or computer space. I say space war because it was very similar to the space war. In fact, Bushnell had actually gotten to play the game during his visits to MIT, where he came up with the idea. However, uh, space war or computer space did not do well. Basically, it was too complicated and way too expensive to make. So he kind of forgets his company he was making and 
according to him, one day while kind of looking for a newspaper, he saw old circuit boards for some older computers being sold for very cheap. Roughly about $100. So, he forms this company called Atari, and with $500 of investment, he decides he's going to try his hand at making another video game. So, he hires somebody by the name of Alan Alcorn, and kind of lies to him. Basically, he said that they had a contract with General Electric to develop an arcade game. And Al was, you know, interested in the work, interested in the idea of making something like this. So he went off and he worked on it. Um, didn't really put two and two together that nobody from General Electric ever called or showed up to check on how things were going. So he sh and after a while, he came up with this game, Pong. And Nolan Bushnell and his associates was were so impressed by it, they decided they were going to prototype it right now. So they go, they go to a bar uh, called Andy Capps Bar. And they say, look, can we put this in here and see what people think of it? And the bar owner says, sure, I don't have anything to lose. I just want, you know, X amount of the profits if this weird thing ever works. Within a week, Atari gets a phone call that something's wrong with their machine. And they they rush out expecting that, of course, one of the electronics failed, something didn't quite work. But when they get there, the issue is that the coin box is overflowing. It has literally jammed because so many quarters had been put in this thing so fast. Palm was a revolution because, one, it was extremely simple to play. You just twist a knob. It's based on tennis, which is a game that people get how to play. And there's not really any gender bias in a game like that. It appealed to men and women. And for it was actually, I don't, at this time, it was considered socially acceptable for a girl to ask a guy to play Pong, which I know sounds wild and scandalous. It's 1972. My word, what's next? But Pong spawned numerous sequels, numerous spin-offs, and a lot of copycats. In fact, Atari kind of uh, went after these copycats. According to Nolan Bushnell, they, in, they uh, purposely mislabeled some of the chips on their boards. That way, if somebody just tried to copy them, they could open it up and point to the chip and say, yeah, that, that's how we know. Give us money. So Palm did extremely, extremely well. And there was somebody who didn't like that. That was Magnabox. That, that was the boys that gave us Game 4. They, uh, they didn't like that somebody else was making a video game. Because remember, because of Ralph Bear, they had the patent rights to any device that manipulates a video signal for entertainment, basically. They owned the rights to the concept of video games itself. In about 1974, they saw that Atari was making a good amount of money and decided it was time to sue. Now, Atari eventually settled with them out of court for a licensing deal, basically. So both sides ended up winning. However, people speculate that if this had gone to court, it's not necessarily sure which way it would have gone. On one end, they did indeed have the patent for this, which patents are extremely strong in court. They, they're almost definitive. However, Pong and the Magnavox Odyssey's tennis game, they're based off ping pong or tennis, an already derivative work, and this is just basically being put on a, on a display. So people aren't necessarily sure how the ruling would have 100% gone, but at the end, Magnavox and Atari decided to settle out of court. Uh, I need to double check, but I believe the amount was like 1.5 million. Uh, we will be talking a lot about Magnavox in their numerous lawsuits throughout the weeks here, so keep that kind of in the back of your hat. Now, around 1975, Atari was doing great from Palm. They had made spinoffs like Doubles Palm, um, Breakout, which was basically Pong with one player, and uh, my favorite, uh, Snoopy Pong, which is exactly what it sounds like. So they kind of realized that, you know, Pong fever was still pretty strong, but kind of dying off. People didn't want to go to arcades to play Pong anymore. So they thought, okay, well, let's, uh, let's make Pong, but for the home. So they partnered with Sears to release these pawn consoles in 1975. Now, the pawn consoles are extremely simple. Um, they have a chip in there um, 
which was kind of difficult to develop at first, according to Bushnell. It was, and I apologize here, I'm literally looking at my notes. Yes, that was it. The LSI chip, I wanted to say TSI, I was one letter off. The LSI chip, which was basically very difficult to produce, but the LSI chip in these Pong consoles had some advantages. First off, once mass produced, they were very cheap. Uh, second off, it was very easy to tell if somebody tried to rip you off and made a, a clone, which there was a lot of Pong clone consoles. My goodness. In fact, there's there were so many Pong clone consoles made by so many different companies that there was kind of a mini market crash in the late 70s because there were so many of these things. Now, incidentally, the Pong craze wasn't only big here in America. It was also big in Germany. Um, of interest, a couple Soviet Pong consoles got released. And there were some Pong consoles released in Japan by a, a little indie company you may have heard of called Nintendo. Atari was the king right now. Pong was insane and their clones like breakout was great they started entering the arcades with things like raceway and super sprint but next week we're going to be talking a bit more about atari especially their introduction of the atari 2600 which you've probably heard about even if you barely know about video games we'll also be talking about the start of arcades really becoming big business and about some competitors who tried to dethrone atari I want to thank you guys so much for watching again if you're watching here on twitch feel free to drop a follow or even subscribe if you like what you're seeing or are financially able to if you're watching this on youtube please consider liking the video and subscribing helps out a lot and next week we'll be going in to week two